Our first speaker has dedicated her life to improving science literacy by communicating scientific principles across media platforms. And I'm so proud of myself for saying that sentence coherently after getting three hours of sleep. So everyone, please give a very warm welcome to Kara Santa Maria. Hey everyone. All right, let me set this up here. And my timepiece. This is my talk. It won't be up there. I don't use PowerPoint, so get ready for me to check my cards every so often. Yay! I'm glad that you guys appreciate that. So I just want to take a minute right at the beginning to let you know kind of what my talk's going to be about and why I do it the way that I do it, how much longer I'm going to be doing it this way. So the very first thing I want to know from you guys in here is, have any of you seen me speak before? Raise your hands. OK, on TV, OK, that's different. But like at a talk at a skeptic convention. So I've only, I've only done a few so far. Those of you who have seen me maybe at Apostacon or at American Atheist or at TAM, this may be a little redundant for you. So I, I apologize in advance. Um, I'm pretty new, not to skepticism, not to atheism, but to the skeptic community. Ooh, it just got really spooky in here. Um, oh, I guess you can see better on the screen this way, but I can't really see you. So I'm pretty new to the skeptic community, and I've been taking maybe the past year or so to attend the conferences that I can with my schedule and get to know each and every one of you. And part of doing that has been making my talk a little bit autobiographical so that you can get to know me, I can get to know you. I'm also really bad, to be honest, and, um, well, I'm really bad at just talking at people. I don't think it's that much fun, and I don't know how much it does for either of us. So I begged and begged and begged the organizers to let me do a Q and A in my um, in my talk. So we're going to be doing that, even though they kind of don't usually allow it. So thank you guys. Um, that'll be really helpful. Um, so this is going to be really informal, and uh, we'll just get into it. So my name is Kara. And, oh, you know what? I didn't even thank, I have to thank the Skepticon organizers. They're really great. They've been really helpful. So before we even get started, since I am the very first talk of the entire session, let's give a big round of applause to the organizers for putting this whole thing together. And thank you so much for inviting me out here to beautiful Springfield, Missouri, where it's nice and warm. It's nothing like Los Angeles. Um, it's a great trek, but really, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to meet each and every one of you. So as a quick introduction, just so that you know where I'm coming from. So my name's Kara. I, um, I work in television. We'll get to that later. But we're going to go way back, way back to the beginning. Um, I was born into a Mormon family. I was born LDS. That was my religion growing up. That's what I knew. I uh, was born in Plano, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. Um, and my folks were Mormon, but they were both converts. Any Mormons in the house right now? Any ex-Mormons in the house? Yeah, we got like four. Woo! Holler. Um, so my, my, my folks are both converts, as many LDS people are probably used to having converts in their family because <laughs> it's a really young religion. Um, and they were both Roman Catholic. My father's Italian. My name's Santa Maria. Um, my mother's Puerto Rican, and they converted together, which sounds kind of insane, but if you know much about the Mormon faith, or really anything about the Mormon faith, you know that it's like really wacky when it gets into the dogma. And I think part of the reason, can you see me when I'm over here? Only when I'm right here. Only when it's like really in my eyes, right? Okay, cool. We're just going to work with that together. I think we're okay. Um, so if you know anything about Mormon dogma, you know that it gets pretty crazy, like we're talking own your own planet crazy. And I think the reason for that is a lot of people who are religious, but who are intelligent, who are dealing with this kind of cognitive dissonance, have a lot of questions. And they want answers to those questions. And I think that my parents are two prime examples of that. My mother is a, a school teacher. She teaches Spanish. My father is an engineer, and they're both educated. They both have undergraduate degrees. They're, they're, they're thoughtful people, 
and they were raised in Catholic families. And I think that they had a lot of questions. You know, the Catholic faith raises a lot of questions. How can God give birth to himself, who's a son, and then there's like a ghost thing, and they're all the same person, but they're three different people. And the Mormon faith works to try to answer those kinds of questions. Their answer to that is that there's, the Trinity is not a thing as Catholics know it. They're actually three completely different beings of flesh and blood, which is like its own version of crazy. And there's a lot of that in the church. You have a question, there's an answer. You have a question, there's an answer. And in order to provide answers to increasingly complicated questions, those answers start to get more and more crazy. You don't realize it all at once, though, when you're young. Because when you're young, you're not exposed to the extent of the dogma that older people are exposed to. So I was born Mormon. I was baptized at eight years old because in the church, eight years old is the age of consent, which I don't know, I guess is better than being baptized when you're a baby. But I don't know about you. As an eight-year-old girl, my biggest concern was pleasing my parents. So when they said, you're eight, you're old enough to make a decision, do you want to be baptized into this church? I was like, is that what you want? Because that's what I want. Um, and so I did, just like all little eight-year-old Mormon kids do. And I, I was baptized. I tried really, really hard. I tried really hard to be a good Mormon. Looking back, I don't think I was one of those people that ever had faith but lost it. I think I probably never actually had faith to begin with, which means that my break from the church was probably a bit easier than some of you sitting out there in the audience right now. But we all have our own stories, and we all kind of came to the realizations that we came to, and all those realizations are very different um, on our own, along our own path. I definitely have very, very kind of um, obvious and crystal clear memories growing up in the church doing baptisms for the dead which is a super weird ritual that they expose young children to my father had um, the priesthood like most men do because it's an incredibly patriarchal and sexist religion like most are and I remember being baptized by my father in the name of like Jedediah, whoever the fuck, over and over and over. And it was creepy and weird, but somehow they made you feel like you were doing the right thing. Um, I remember bearing my testimony on Sunday morning saying, I'd like to bear my testimony. I know this church is true. I love my mom and dad in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because that's what all kids said. Those of you in the audience who were raised Mormon, remember that. You remember that. You're the ones who got it when you went to see Book of Mormon on Broadway. You were like, this is for me. I get all the jokes, not just some of the jokes. I was with you. Um, so I did all of this crazy stuff, and, uh, and then I left the church. I left the church at 14 years old which is kind of an odd time in your life to come to the realization that you don't believe in God and that you need to get out. Partially because I was a pretty precocious kid, but I was still living with my parents, which is a tough place to be when you realize that you're not Mormon. And not only are you not Mormon, you're probably an atheist. So my parents had divorced. I was living with my mother full time and my father every other weekend and for a few weeks in the summer. And I remember very specifically, and again, I apologize to those of you who have heard this story before, but I remember very specifically trying to communicate with my father that I don't think this makes sense to me. I have a lot of questions. I've been seeking answers to those questions for a long time now. And I, I haven't found anything satisfactory and really feeling a lot of pushback, not like, I get it, let's explore this together, let's figure it out so that we can help you find the spirit again, but a lot of kind of like, yeah, well, that's, you just gotta pray, you know, gotta pray. Um, and I was like, I've tried praying and nothing happens. And so I finally kind of got the gumption to stand up and to say, listen, I don't believe. Like, I don't believe, and it's to the extent now that I feel like I'm lying to my, I mean, this is not a ploy to not have to wake up early on Sunday morning. Like, I'll wake up early and do chores, I don't care. But I can't keep going to this place and keep pretending that I have faith in this thing that just 
doesn't compute for me. And remember too, like as a Mormon child, not remember, most of you weren't raised Mormon, as a Mormon child you dedicate a lot of time to the church. It's a very familial um, religion and it, it takes up all of your time. We're talking three hours of church every Sunday, two hours of uh, youth group every Wednesday night, and uh, about an hour or two a family home evening every Monday and usually visiting um, teaching from the missionaries. And then before school, when you're at that age, when you first start high school, before school for an hour at 6 a.m. every day, it's called seminary, and that's where you do Bible and Book of Mormon study. So it's a pretty big kind of dedication of your time. And so I remember going to my father and stay, saying, I don't believe, I'm spending a lot of my time feeling like I'm living a lie. In many ways, I, I felt like I needed to come out. And I talked to him about it, and he basically responded, I remember it crystal clear to this day, as long as you're living under my roof, I have a moral obligation to God to force you to go to church until you're 18. When you're 18, you can make that decision on your own. And I felt very strongly at the age of 14, as a precocious kid, that I was at an age of consent. And I said to him, if you want to go to court and you want to talk to a judge, I'm pretty sure I can argue my case that, this, that you can't do this and I could just stay full time with my mother. He gave me that option and so that's the choice that I made and I, I went full time with my mother. Which, I mean, if you think about it, for a 14 year old kid, is a lot of responsibility on your shoulders because really I was faced with a decision. Do I keep going to church and keep my family together? Or do I quit going to church and discover who I am as a human being but give up the chance to spend time with my father? And one thing I didn't mention is that my father at this point had remarried and there were three no, there were two new children. There are now three more um, than that. So there was a whole kind of secondary family there that I was feeling like a lot of pressure to sort of maintain, um, maintain a relationship with. So ultimately I did choose to leave, which caused a lot of fallout for me in my family. So my father and I actually didn't speak for maybe four years, something like that. I, I left school when I was 16 and started college early. And during that transitional part of my life, I didn't have any, any connection with my father. And not until I was a little bit older, he and his wife had adopted three more boys. One of those boys had some difficulties, um, some neuropsychiatric difficulties. Did my dad reach out to me again? And we started to have conversations, but much more as peers and much less as kind of a father-daughter situation. So that was a very tough thing for me in my life. It was something that I think in a lot of ways shaped who I um, am now and who I became. I, we've moved past it. My dad and I have a decent relationship now. Um, I do notice though, and we can talk openly. I talk openly about my atheism. He talks openly about religion. So there's a respect there that I think I didn't have when I was young. Partially I think because I was one of the first batch of kids. And the more kids you have, the more you realize like, oh, that kid was not that bad. You know, and so I think that he's, especially now he has boys too, which is like a whole other thing. Um, and so I think he's, so, and he's softened a bit with age. And I've of course let go of some of the anger that I had. I was really struggled with anger for many, many years. Um, but one thing that I noticed that's still there, and maybe some of you have experienced this, is because I, I would bet that most everybody in this room right now no matter what your kind of stance is on religion, has somebody in your family that's either evangelical or that's incredibly devout, and, and you deal with that. That's a regular thing you deal with and you cope with it. And one thing that I found is that the emotion that I can't seem to get past with my father, and I think that the emotion that he also can't get past with me is one of kind of sympathy. There's a bit of like we feel sorry for each other. Like, I feel sorry that he's stuck in that world. And I know in his heart of hearts, because he's so devout, that he feels sorry that I'm, like, going to go to hell. Like, he thinks that's going to happen. Maybe not hell, because Mormons don't really believe in that. But outer darkness with a gnashing of teeth. I think that that's what the passage says. So wherever that is, it's very cold and away from God's light. And he just, that would be terrible in his mind. So that, that's a tough thing um, that, that we both deal with. And the funny thing is that I still haven't gotten to what I do or why I'm here. Um, 
I'm a science communicator. That's, that's kind of my full-time job, and it's freaking awesome that that can be a full-time job. And I didn't find science first. Science did not inform my decision to leave the church. It, it was kind of self-evident that the church was a load of, of shit before I even found science. So um, it, it, it's interesting how much those experiences in my life have shaped my ability to do what I do now, which is speak very openly and very honestly about um, those experiences, about my struggles with mental illness, but also about why science is so important in our society right now. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that next, which was kind of finding science. So first I came out as an atheist. Later I came out as a scientist. Um, so when I was in school, I, I was a precocious kid, as I mentioned. I was definitely, uh, did well in science when I was young, but I did well in most subjects when I was young. And then as I got older, just like a lot of kids who are, you know, burnouts, I smoked a lot of weed and kind of gave up on school. And I had cool friends and we went out and we partied and, you know, I, I wasn't Mormon anymore, so it didn't matter. And I got a lot of that aggression out. And then I, as I said, I left school when I was 16 and I started college. And that first year of college, I was deathly afraid of science. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, but I know I was afraid of science. And again, I apologize if you've already heard this, but my undergraduate degree, I went to the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, which is like the mini Austin of Texas. Yeah, it's a little, little tiny blue dot in the middle of a big red state. And so I, I was afraid of science. So I did take three science courses in my undergraduate degree because they were required. I took oceanography, thought it would be easy. It wasn't. Um, I took astronomy, stellar astronomy, because one of those had to be a physical science. And I was like, OK, I was a smoker then. Smoking is bad. I don't smoke anymore. At the time, I was a cigarette smoker. And I liked the idea of going to lab and being able to smoke cigarettes at the observatory. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> And then, and then the last class I took, I'm not even lying, I want to call it paleontology, but it wasn't called paleontology. In the course manual, it was called dinosaurs in all capital letters. <laughs> Literally with an exclamation point at the end. And I was like, well, yeah, if that's a science class, I'm taking it. Still to this day, I'm a huge dinosaur nerd. I love them. I have an Archaeopteryx lithographica tattooed on my forearm, and I have like the entire Carnegie collection, which are scale models, 1 40th of size at my apartment. It's embarrassing when I have like boys over. Um, so I was really afraid of science, as, as that explains to you. But then I decided that I was going to study. I had to choose a major eventually, so I picked, um, I picked psychology. I started school as a vocal jazz performance major. I had been a singer, a competitive singer in high school. And I started studying vocal jazz in college. I went to an incredibly competitive music school. That's why I chose it. Also, it was 45 minutes from my house. Um, and you didn't have to write an essay. I remember that being a big uh, attractant at the time. But so I, I ended up changing majors because I found that the more I learned um, jazz theory and the more I had to learn piano and my hands don't do what my brain tells them to do, the less I enjoyed singing. And I wanted to preserve my love for singing. So. I, um, I tried to find another major. On a random tangent note, I think that was one of my last things that held me in the church, actually, was singing. I love to sing. And I used to literally think, as my father would explain to me, that the chills that I got were the Holy Spirit kind of taking over me. I was, I was singing this beautiful church music, and, and I was always the one that you know, came up on the, on the pulpit and, and sang for the congregation, and I would sing at weddings, but also at funerals. And it was very meaningful and emotional, and I eventually realized I just like music. And you know, a lot of music is sacred music. A lot of the most beautiful music is sacred music, because back in the day, like, that's all anybody ever sang about. Um, now I get that. At the time, it was a bit confusing for me. Anyway cut to college. So I, I finally decided to get a psychology degree because at the time I thought it would be easy. It's like, oh yeah, that seems like an easy degree to get. So I studied psychology and the more I studied psychology, the more I realized I love psychology. And ultimately I finished an undergraduate degree in psychology and along the way I found neuroscience. That's when I started working with a professor who also had a private practice in, um, in a little town in Texas. And he, I was just explaining this to, to somebody who was at my merch table. He um, had a commission with the Texas Commission for the Blind. And you may or may not know, but uh, blindness is often comorbid with, with brain damage. 
especially if it's congenital blindness. The retina is part of the central nervous system and there are a lot of issues that happen kind of pre or perinatal that can cause both blindness and brain damage. So we would work a lot with patients who are dealing with both. And in doing that, I did my first research project, which was um, a neuropsychological evaluation of uh, visually impaired and blind people and how they fare on different measures. And um, it was really enlightening. My, my professor was actually a brilliant man and he came up with a neuropsych battery for people who couldn't see. Because if you think about it, you've probably seen like block design tests, like where you stack up the little blocks to try and mimic what the researcher is doing. These are tests of, of neuropsych ability. So intelligence test, um, they've got you know cognitive flexibility and spatial reasoning and all these things, there's a big battery. They're all for people with vision. And so my, my professor was a brilliant man and he came up with this great non-sighted test that relied a lot on tactile um, sensibilities. And so I, I worked with him to give these exams to individuals and eventually I did my research project on it. And that really got me into science. It got me into statistics. It got me into the scientific method and the wonders of trying to answer questions based on available evidence and, and making statements um, and inferences based on actual perceptible things of the world around you and it got me really excited. And around that time I realized that I probably didn't know enough about the brain. My psych program was a good psych program but it wasn't a great psych program and it really didn't give me the f kind of foundational knowledge that I thought that I needed. So I switched um, departments. I, I did my psychology and then I went over to the biology department and I was like take me in and they did weirdly because I had no background in biology and they let me get a master's degree in neuroscience I had to take some catch-up courses um, not catch up but catch up um, classes and so uh, and then I started teaching it was really great so I taught bio one and I taught animal phys and I taught a and p um, and all these great classes and I really you don't know uh, subject until you've taught it. Like I thought that I knew what I was talking about when I took the classes and when I took the exams and I made good grades and then I was like oh I really don't understand this when you're teaching kids and they have brilliant questions and you have to look up the answers together and learn about those things together and the light bulb goes, goes off in both of your heads and that's my favorite thing, my absolute favorite thing. So, so I did this master's degree in neuroscience. I worked in the lab of Dr. Gunter Gross and he had developed an MEA system. I won't bore you with the details, but we basically took brain matter from fetal mice and we put it on plates and the plates had electrodes embedded in them and we were able to do all sorts of cool experiments. And along the way I managed my lab and I ran a cell culture facility and it was amazing. Um, it was an amazing, lear amazing learning experience both in management and in science and in teaching. Then I moved to New York to, to work on a PhD in clinical neuropsychology, which is a field that kind of merges the two. And I did about one year towards that PhD before I dropped out cold. Um, and the reason for it was many, many fold. I moved to LA for a relationship, but I also kind of had been realizing something. When you're a graduate student, anybody in here in graduate school right now? Anyone? I can't really see. Yeah, a few hands. Anybody in here went to graduate school sometime? Yeah. Okay, so, so as you remember, when you're in graduate school, you have three responsibilities. Your number one responsibility is to your research. That's the most important thing that you're supposed to do. Your number two responsibility is generally to your coursework, because at least in, you know, when you're working on the master's and early stages of your PhD, you still have some coursework to finish. And the number three responsibility is often to your students. And some people are lucky enough to not even teach because they have amazing fellowships. Many people teach because they need the money. I very quickly realized in graduate school that I did not like being in my own lab. I was, I actually did enjoy being in the classroom, but more than anything else, I love teaching. And when you realize that you like teaching more than you like doing your own research, you have to start rethinking your priorities. And I, I decided, you know what? I want to do this all the time. I want to be a teacher. This is what I love to do. I'm not a good bench scientist. I'm an okay bench scientist. I get the work done. It's not my forte. It's not what I'm the best at. And so it was a big, hard, long decision. But ultimately, ultimately I decided to leave my PhD program in New York, move to California, and I was started looking at teaching colleges and I started trying to figure out exactly what my next move was going to be. But at the time I was dating um, a prominent individual who had a lot of experience in television and was really starting to push me in a direction that I never expected to go in. 
I didn't ever think I was going to be on TV. I never wanted to be on TV. And in fact, the first time I was ever booked on TV, I seriously almost shit my pants. Um, the first time I was ever on television, I was on the full hour of Larry King Live, which was absolutely insane. Like I was thrown to the wolves. And it was myself and three middle-aged dudes. It was um, Dr. Drew, who you probably know. It was Dr. Amen, who's a bit woo. And um, Dr. Pratt, who's also eh. And so I remember walking, I was in the green room and the producer comes out and says, Kara, okay, um, no, Dr. Santa Maria, Dr. Santa no, no, don't call me that, I'm not a doctor. Okay, okay, we got it. And then, oh, so what book are you plugging today? I was like, oh God, I don't have a book. What am I doing here? <laughs> this is, oh. And so, so I did it and I got through the hour and I didn't sweat too much. Nobody could really tell. I was totally out of my league. You can find it on YouTube, it's pretty funny. Um, but it, I was thrown to the wolves and it helped because I started to get more and more experience. After that, I did, a, I did a show for HBO actually that never went to air. It was um, a television show that we called Talk Nerdy. No, it was called Talk Nerdy to Me. And um, it was really funny and sciencey and dorky and nerdy and they didn't buy it. And we couldn't sell it anywhere else because it was like an edgy, cool science show. So we went to the smart ne networks and they were like, you say fuck like 30 times in this TV show. <laughs> oh, sorry. And then you go to the edgy networks and they're like, we don't understand it. So it really didn't have a home, but it taught me what people want to see on TV. And since then, I've worked in television pretty much full time. There were some ups and downs, but now I'm happy to say that I've been very lucky. I've had a rich career. The two things that I do right now full time is I work on a television show called Techno, which is on Al Jazeera America. And that's a, a weekly science show where we go out into the field and we learn about kind of new innovations. I'm also on a show for those of you who do live in Southern California in the LA market called SoCal Connected. It's been on for 50 years on this uh, network KCET, which used to be the PBS affiliate there. So public television, no funding, lots of fun. Um, Previously, uh, I did stuff for Nat Geo. I did a Weather Channel show with um, uh, John Rennie, and uh, that was a really great show that he was hosting and I was a, a contributor on. Did a bunch of stuff for you know all these different networks. I was on a, a show for Pivot TV for about a year. It was a live daily political show for millennials called Take Part Live. Um, a very trying experience for me, a very difficult work environment with um, an executive producer who didn't like women very much. So that was interesting, but it also taught me an awful, awful lot. And I've also done a lot of alternative media, which I actually enjoy a lot more. I've worked with the Young Turks. Many of you out there who probably do know of me probably know of me through the Young Turks because I've done so much work with them. Um, and out of that really came podcasting. So podcasting is where my head is at right now. I do those two regular TV shows and I also do one-offs periodically. Like right now I'm doing a series with Vice and GE, which is why I'm exhausted. Um, flying out here is my ninth flight of the month. By the end it will be 11 because I'm going to London next week for one day. <laughs> yeah. Thanks guys. Um, yeah. So, but that's, you know, I can't complain because, oh, I can, I just did. Um, Luxury problems, so I shouldn't complain. I really shouldn't. I've, I've been very, very lucky. And I'll tell you that when I was working on Take Part Live, I can't believe I'm saying this publicly because there's like a feed and everybody on YouTube is going to be able to see this. Um, but when I was working on Take Part Live, as I said, it was a really trying experience. It was a great show with an amazing staff. It was the first time I've ever done like traditional set television, you know, like a hair and makeup girl and wear the short skirt and come out on set and read the teleprompter. It was not me, I didn't feel comfortable. They tried to dress me like a different person and really push me to have different opinions than I have. I fought back constantly. It was a huge struggle. And during that, there were times when I would lose myself a bit. And this is when podcasting is something that I fell into. I had been a guest on Joe Rogan's podcast, I think at this point, twice. And he was always saying, you, you got a podcast, it's so good for you, you've got a podcast. And eventually his fans would tweet me and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't ignore it anymore. And I'm so glad that I did because what it allows me to do and what it allows any of you out there who listen or who contribute or who call in to do is speak very openly and honestly without um, a network executive telling you what to do, without an executive producer telling you what to do, without any you know editors being able to edit you. My podcast, Talk Nerdy, I um, 
produce myself, I book myself, I edit myself, I do all of my ad sales, all my merch sales myself. And it, it's built this amazing community of people who can get in contact with me directly. They can message me via Facebook, via Twitter. I, we talk, they tell me who they want to hear on the podcast, they tell me what kinds of topics they want me to discuss, and I get to be right there with the people who make it happen, and that's huge for me. It's also listener-supported through their donations, through, through their merchandise um, purchases, and then also through some ad sales on the side. I'm able to con keep giving it away for free. It's a totally free, just like this conference, right? You've got you got to help out, but then once you do, it's, it's a free service. And it's been... Um, it's been huge for me because I think it brought me back to what matters, which I'll get to in a second, but it's brought me back to my roots and, and why having the kinds of conversations that I have on the podcast are absolutely so important. So I've had a lot of great guests, you know, some people who are probably famous in this room, like Shermer and um, David Silverman, Lawrence Krauss, also like sex nerd Sandra and um, Karen Bondar. I don't know if you follow kind of biology or physics, Veritasium, his name's Derek Muller, he does a cool YouTube uh, channel called Veritasium. And also I'm really pleased to announce, actually I had to write it down because I would have forgotten, that starting on December 3rd, which is a Wednesday, I will be the new science correspondent weekly on Dogma Debate with David Smalley. So those of you who listen to that show, you'll be able to uh, keep up with the latest science news there. Very excited about that partnership. I'm so glad he reached out to me. So I guess the question now is what does all of this have to do with you and science and atheism, like what do they really have to do with each other? And I think that we all have kind of a vague notion of that. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to answer that any better because it's something that I, I don't know if I struggle with it, but it's something that informs the work that I do all the time. You, I as a person am not who I am without the atheism and the science component and also the feminism component to be honest like those are the three things that really drive my work a lot. I have to say that I was really affected when I first read uh, this book by Chris Mooney called Unscientific America a few years ago and he specifically has a chapter about new atheism and that's been targeted by a lot of people. A lot of people were not happy with that chapter. I took away a lot from it in, in kind of a non-judgmental way, but in a way that I think informed my decision making because up until that point, I was this young chick on air and I'm talking about being an atheist and there's nobody else like me, which is bullshit because we know there's other people like me. There's a lot of other young cool chicks on air talking about atheism, but in some respects you're in a vacuum and you don't meet those people very often. And I was also angry. You know, I was angry. I was angry that I was raised Mormon and I was angry that it took me so long to come to that conclusion, which looking back, I was like a tiny kid. I'm actually really happy that I got out when I did. But I'm angry that like I have a brother who struggles with identity issues and who probably can't come out to his parents because he's raised in this Mormon trap too. I was angry about a lot of things. And I think that I wore that anger on my sleeve and I really was what um, Mooney calls a new atheist. I was a militant atheist. I was an atheist who was like, you're fucking stupid if you believe in God. That's stupid. Why would anybody believe in God? And I started to realize that even if there's an aspect of that inside of us and even if there's a part of that that I thought and held really dearly. The truth is, what did I do for a living? What do I do for a living? I'm a science communicator first and foremost. I do television, I do podcasting, I do news hits, and I write, oh, for I forgot it, for like a year and a half or two years actually, I worked as a science correspondent at the Huffington Post, or the Puffington Host. Um, before they had a science page, they hired me on to help build a science page out, and I did a weekly series called Talk Nerdy to Me there, which was a really great experience, because before that, their rep for science was fucking terrible. They did science only on the environmental pages, and, um, and they never covered physics, they never covered basic science, and when they did cover science, it would be like in the health pages, and then it was like all, like Deepak Chopra is not a scientist, like that's not science. So I was able to help build up a science page that was rigorous and, and do legitimate science reporting on that page, and I was, I was really happy with, with what we were able to accomplish. Eventually I, I ended up leaving because it was an environment that I don't think I was thriving in, but cut to what we're talking about now. Um, so. 
I realize as a science communicator, I usually like pace a lot more, but I'm having to hug the middle because the lights are weird. Um, I realize that as a science communicator, probably the worst way to get my message across that science is an important tool to use to investigate the world around us and make decisions is to go, you're stupid. <laughs> you believe in God, that's so stupid. <laughs> I don't think that I was really getting through to people by being so angry and so militant. And I realized really quickly that there are a lot of people out there, if you sit down and you talk to them, who have figured out, and I am telling you, it is beyond me how they do it, but who have figured out how to reconcile religion and science. They've figured it out. They're probably not fundamentalists. Most of them don't believe in science. They're probably not, you know, hardcore evangelicals, but there are many, many people out there who are bright, intelligent people who, for whatever reason, have a sense of, and I fucking hate this word, spirituality. I, I, I hate it because I don't understand it. But there are people out there who, who, who feel spiritual or they have religious feelings that they perfectly vibe with, with their scientific understanding. And there are people who are shades of gray on that spectrum. And I think sometimes we're very extremist. The same way that we're so used to looking at like gay and straight, right? Like you're either gay or you're straight, but we all know that we're all really somewhere on the spectrum. I mean, I'm a hardcore atheist, so maybe it's not quite the same. But I think that there are people out there who have figured out how to, how to merge those two and to have both. And again, I don't fully understand it, but I do respect their ability to do it because what I'm so much more impressed by is the fact that they are accepting and working, striving to understand the scientific method in spite of the fact that they have these religious dogmas that they're dealing with. And so instead of being angry or making fun of them or feeling like I'm better than them, I really appreciate the steps that individuals who in this culture and in this country and in their families were so surrounded in this bubble by religion. As we know, there's so much religious and specifically Christian privilege in this country. And they're raised in that and they've managed to still embrace science. That to me is a boon. That's something that we should be happy about. And so as I started to think that way, the way that I approach science communication really started to change. There are different people, and I do think it takes all types. I recently did a podcast with David Silverman, and, and one of the conversations that we had online was he was very staunch about the fact that there's no such thing as an atheist Jew. My best friend is an atheist Jew. And it was interesting to go back and forth because his response, Jason's response to this podcast was not happy. Like he did not like what David had to say. I totally can kind of understand both sides. I was not raised Jewish. I have that luxury. I don't have any sort of tradition that's keeping me in that. David felt very strongly that you can't be both atheistic and a Jew. You can be Ashkenazi, but that's a culture. It's not a religion. Or I should say that's almost like a, I guess it's not really a race, but whatever. It's very confusing, this whole situation. And what I realized talking to both of them is that it kind of reminds me of the Woody Allen, Pygmalion comedy. Did you guys ever see Whatever Works, the one with, um, what's his name, from Curb Your Enthusiasm? Anybody here see that? Larry David. Anybody see Whatever Works? It's kind of gross. It's a Pygmalion comedy. He's like dating a girl who's really, really young, like underage young. It's Woody Allen. But but the message of it, I think, really speaks to me, which is, just like it says, whatever works, man. Like, for David Silverman, it's important that he be really militant, and he'll admit that. I wrote the foreword to the book that he's going to get published soon, and he, he admits it very openly in the pages of that book. Like, I'm militant. That's my vibe. I head up the American Atheist. I have to be on the leading edge of this. For my friend Jason, he's and he's got one foot really deeply in the Jewish community and goes to Israeli dance every week, and then the other foot deeply rooted in the scientific atheist community, and that's his bridge. You know, for me, I'm a science communicator, but I have a very public face, and I slip the atheism in as often as I can, but I also have to tread lightly when I'm working on networks that wouldn't allow for that overtly, because I'm, I, I feel very strongly that you can kind of make more waves from inside the system than from outside just like beating on the walls when nobody's listening to you. 
And so the more that I've worked in this field and the more that I've had the amazing opportunity, and especially the more that I've come to these skeptic conventions to meet all of you, the more that I've realized that whatever works and it takes all types, if we were all the exact same, if we were all you know, hardcore, staunch, militant, quote unquote atheists, everybody would hate us, right? But if, if we were all sort of like moderate and wishy-washy, probably we wouldn't be moving the bar that much. And so we're all on the same team, but we all have different roles on that team to play. The role though that we each share the responsibility in, I think, is, is the role to understand that kind of as atheists, skeptics, free thinkers, agnostics, whatever you call yourself, you have a responsibility to your community to be a moral individual. You have a responsibility to, to your community to be an exemplar. Now, I don't think that you should come out if you don't feel comfortable coming out. I don't think, and a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but if you are raised, if you're a kid still, if you're in a family where coming out would put you in harm's way, if you're in a community where you're literally afraid for your life if you have to come out, that is so your decision. And I would say the same thing to my gay friends, to my lesbian friends, to my trans friends. It's your decision whether or not you want to come out. If you have the luxury to be able to come out, and especially like myself, you have the luxury to speak on a stage and to, to have the ear of the general public and talk about coming out, accept the responsibility that comes with that, which is setting an example and showing the world that atheists are more trustworthy than rapists, as the study would not lead you to believe, and that atheists are upstanding members of the community, and that we're passionate about the Constitution, and we're passionate about civil rights and First Amendment rights, because the truth is, we make decisions based on literature, and history, and, and morality, and philosophy. We don't make decisions based on some fear of retribution after we're long gone. So, we need to remember that what makes us strong as individuals and all of the work that we've done in our own lives to be able to stand our, on our own two feet and say this is who I am and this is what I believe or don't believe um, is what we, can, what we can really offer, I think, the American public is we are a country that's very behind in this respect. There are many places that are much more progressive than we are, as you all know. And so I think that we do have to work together. And each of us has a different role to play, whether it's being comfortable enough to talk to your best friends, or being comfortable enough to talk to your coworkers, or being comfortable enough to talk to a room full of people, and living your life and setting an example that says, don't be afraid of me as an atheist. I'm not going to harm you. And not only am I not going to harm you, I'm going to do good for my community and I'm going to get up and vote, especially vote. Look at what happened, oh, in the midterm elections, it's so depressing. I mean, we have people like Senator Inhofe who literally believe, he's not just not, it's not just that he thinks that global warming isn't true, he thinks it's a hoax, like it's an invented hoax. And this guy is on like the Senate Committee for, envi for the Environment. Like, he's the chair of the Senate Committee for the Environment. More than half of the people on the House Science Committee are like global warming deniers. This is a dangerous time that we live in. And I think one of the only ways that we're gonna change it is to start small, but to set that example, be engaged in the political process, and really help people around you understand that atheism is not something to be afraid of, but it's something to be proud of, and there's a strong community there, and we are all members of that community together. And I think on that note, yeah, I don't <laughs> I think that's, you know, that's my introduction to you. I, I'm very excited to meet you guys. I'm not sure if they set up a microphone or not. I was gonna say at the very beginning, if people who want to like ask questions, wanna be down towards the front, I also, I'm. I don't know, I got pretty good ears, so you can literally yell them out to me, and I will just repeat them in the microphone, and that way folks on, um, folks on YouTube will be able to hear. I think they might have recommended, though, that you come up here. Can we turn the house lights on? Is that possible? No? 
Bueller? Oh, well. Okay. So if anybody does have a question, come up here and I'll just hold my mic down for you. Ah, there we go. Um, and we can, I don't know, have a conversation, which is how I prefer to do this anyway. So technically, there's still like 10 minutes in my talk. I was so prepared. Hey. And maybe because the camera's right there. So like, look at, no, take my, but look at the camera so they can see you. <laughs> and talk in the mic. I, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, so my first question was in regards to, we were talking, you were talking earlier about the importance of understanding that, you know, religious can be intelligent and then actually can embrace science. Um, one of the things I wanted to, talk, to ask a question about was um, moderate religious scientists. Um, there's a guy named Francis Collins. He wrote a book called The Language of God, and he actually talks about how his embracing of evolution and his embracing of Christianity can be melded into one, and that he kept both systems simultaneous, and that evolution informs his belief in God, and his belief in God informs his approach to evolution. And you have a lot of scientists out there. Um, you also have, for instance, Kenneth Miller. He wrote Finding Darwin's God. Um, you have a lot of these very intelligent people who will still argue for the existence of God based on science. And I would say, how would you respond to somebody who is um, a religious scientist who would then argue and say that therefore because science is possible, then therefore God must exist? So I think that those are two really good examples that you brought up. Um... Miller and Collins, because they are people who are very much in the public spotlight. But I also, I would argue that they do a very good job of keeping their science and their religion separate. I think that they, they more than almost anybody else, do a good job of when they are in an academic kind of capacity and when they're in a scientific capacity say this is what the evidence shows us these are the um, results based on that evidence this is where we're going in this direction and then they'll write a popular book that is not listed in the science section about religion now it, it is difficult though because let's say Francis Collins is head of the NIH like people are gonna look at him and go you're a scientist I believe what you say I have faith in in you as a person who is disseminating information that was based on scientific um, inquisition, and you are saying that you believe in God and that you are an evolutionist, or uh, that you're an evolutionist, but you're also like some sort of weird hybrid creationist. And I think that it is the responsibility of the scientist first to make sure that we keep those things separate. Now, what you see a lot of times is like a secondary bastardization of that. I have a lot of friends who are physicists who got totally effed over by that movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? I don't know if you guys remember that movie, where they basically took a bunch of uh, quantum physicists and, and cosmologists and they, they did interviews with them totally under the guise of doing a more like physics focused movie and then took them out of context and cut them. And, and, and the hard thing, this is a hard lesson that we all learn in journalism, for example, let's look at the, um, the, uh, the vaccine autism Lancet article that was written. And, and we know that it's much easier to get information out there the first time you get it out there and to follow a news peg the first time that it kind of hits people across the head. And the retraction never gets as much footing as, as the initial article. And it's hard because as, as the press, as the media, which I kind of pseudo consider myself a member of the press too because I do a lot of journalism, we have to work really hard at setting the record straight. That kind of fifth estate, our job is supposed to be to, to make sure that we're getting truth out there. That's the fundamental job of a journalist. And unfortunately, in this world of like 24 hour news cycle and for profit journalism, that's not what we always see. Unfortunately, I think that it is those individuals' rights to be able to, I mean, I totally protect their First Amendment rights to be able to say, I'm both religious and a scientist and this is why. I think what's important is that we 
ensure and we hold them up to a standard that they keep those things in the arenas in which it's appropriate. So if you are a scientist communicating science, you should not slip religion into it. If you're writing a book on the side and you wanna write about why religion matters to you, that's perfectly fine, but the more that we do this kind of work and the more that we educate the public and try and help the, that level of science literacy rise and rise and rise in the community, I think the more that the community is gonna be armed with the ability to tell the difference between the two. As of right now, though, we're struggling and I can see why that's a huge concern. I think the best way to combat it is to do what we can do to improve science literacy kind of across the board. This is probably not the answer that you were looking for, but. <laughs> It's all I've got, yeah. What? Eh? No, oh, okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Just yell it out and I'll repeat it. That's fine. Uh, what would you do to encourage more people to get into the media as far as, uh, like on YouTube? I have my own YouTube channel. Encourage, and I often try to encourage other people to come out that way. I mean, if you're already out, mm -hmm. encourage other people. Because one of the problems with atheism is people related to doctors or parents or the really the hardcore ones where there's a lot more Like the Mr. Rogers atheist, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For sure, so, so the question here was how, how would we kind of um, inspire or encourage people to come out through avenues that are helpful like YouTube where um, you have a platform to be able to come out and if you're already out um, and, and talk about your atheism um, because the concern is that a lot of people associate atheism with these new atheists, with the, with the Dawkins and the, and the Harrises and the Hitchens of the world. Um, and I think that that's a great idea. And I think a lot of people, you have that ability now if you have a smartphone and you have an internet connection, that's all you have actually need to do like pretty good quality videos online and it doesn't take much or to podcast. Podcasting is even cheaper and easier than doing YouTube videos um, and it's a great platform and I think the way honestly the way look at how millennials do it so they're a good model right because all millennials are freelancers who like make their own content which is great I mean I make a living doing it so I can't really scoff um, and I think the reason, not the core reason, but a reason that in, entices them to do that is an appeal to their vanity. Like it's, it's people live by the likes on their Facebook page and they live by the retweets on their Twitter and going out there and putting those things out on YouTube is basically taking a tweet or taking a Facebook post and making it multimedia and making it deeper and making it more broad reaching. and. Being able to be a, as specific as you possibly can, because if you're the one creating that content, nobody is going to be able to edit that content. There is a source file online that anybody can point to and say, look, this is what I said. Yeah, you might have pulled me out of context there. You might have Frank invited me and put me into this piece here, but this is the source file. Look at it, look at the context, look at the nuance. This is what I was saying. So in some ways it kind of protects your speech. In some ways it appeals to your vanity, but across the board, if it's something that you are interested in doing, I definitely recommend doing it. And it's good practice too, because nobody's gonna watch it first. And the more that you do it, the more that you're gonna get views. Same thing with a blog. Like if you've been thinking about it, don't wait, just start it. And if you're afraid that you like suck at it, it's okay because nobody's really watching. And then eventually as you learn, your viewers are gonna learn with you. We all go back and look at our early work and are really embarrassed by it, but it's kind of funny too. It, but when you look at the view count, the view count is really low. So the more that you do it, the more engagement you'll get and you'll get better at it. The best way to get good at that is just to do it. Anyone else? Yes. I like your shirt. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Sure, so she was asking if I could speak a little bit about um, atheism and feminism and my experience with that and, and that there are obviously problems with it in the religious communities but, but as we all read the news and, and see from experience there are some problems with it in the atheist community as well. So kind of a couple of points on that. The first point is that I'm very new to the atheist community as I mentioned before. I, um, I'm not new to being an atheist but I definitely am one of these people who 
throughout my life had a tendency to sort of go rogue and to, in my vanity, think that I was like the only one. So I remember coming out back in Texas and being like, I'm the only atheist in Dallas. Or when I first decided to do science communication and I finally got that job at HuffPost and it was a legitimate job and I had the credentials, I was like, this is what I do for a living. I communicate science. I like invented a whole new career path. And all these people were like, no, that's like a bunch of us already do that. And then I learned, I went to these conferences and I got close to all of my colleagues and it made me that much better at my job. Um, so to some extent, I always had this sense of, you hear the stories and you hear about girls dealing with advances and things that are uncomfortable and it's like, oh, you know, whatever. I've dealt with it my whole life. That's just what it means to be a girl. And you kind of take the good with the bad and blah, blah, blah. And only recently did I actually have an incredibly trying experience where I was podcasting with an individual who was like relentless and uncomfortable in a sanctioned place and um, really struggled with what I wanted to do about it. I won't name any names, obviously, and I chose not to name any names on air about this. And it was a personal decision of mine because one thing that I find across the board, and I kind of see this with like my friends who are dealing with the Gamergate stuff right now, is that I speak up all the time about feminism, about atheism, about whatever, and I speak up for my sisters and I speak up for my brothers and I think it's really important to stand our ground. But I also find that sometimes when you're in the public eye, you have to be smart about your PR and you have to kind of pick your battles because if I were to choose to take on that specific situation, that might become what my career is and that might become how I'm defined in the media, which is something that I was afraid would take away from what I'm trying to do. And I think my answer to sexism in the atheist community is my answer to sexism at large. I think the significant difference between the religious communities or religious organizations and the atheist community is that sexism, misogyny, patriarchy in many of these religious organizations is institutionalized. It's a part of the dogma. It's a part of what people are spouting. And it's in everything. It's in, it, it, it it comes up from the time you're born and you're meant to feel less than as a woman. You're meant to feel that you serve the man who then serves God, that he is somehow the conduit. I think in the atheist community, sexism is just what it is in the general population. Sexism occurs when guys are sexist. And that's something that comes from being raised in the culture that we're raised in. And it, in some ways, might even be a secondary effect of this Christian privilege that we've all experienced. So I really am just excited about how many guys I meet in the atheist community who are feminists. I also am the kind of person, and again, it takes all types. I know women who are much more, um, put their foot down a little bit harder than I do, but I'm the kind of person where online, if I get a comment or I get like a creepy kind of statement, I try to look at intent and I try to figure out, is this a guy who is being overtly gross or is this a guy who kind of doesn't know the difference? And maybe, because there have been experiences where people have said like mansplained to me, or they've said things that are like kind of horrible. And then I've responded and been like, dude, like I don't know if you realize it, but that's really kind of insulting and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh shit, I had no idea. And that to me is much more fulfilling than just saying like, men are horrible. You know, I'm just, I'm not that kind of person. And so I get it. There are always going to be people that you encounter, women in the audience. And, and I mean, this is actually a really great room because I see a lot of female faces. I've definitely been involved in atheist um, groups where there were not nearly as many women. But mind you, same exact problem in science, in STEM. I used to talk all the time, or I still talk all the time about women in STEM and what we can do to raise our numbers. And I realized one day, as I started to make that transition into media, that there are like almost more problems with women in production than there are with women in science. Like, I'm amazed, right now I'm on a shoot for GE and Vice and my core crew is all female. I have a female director, a female DP, a female AP, and a female um, BCAM, which is insane. It's the first time in my life I've ever experienced that. Usually my entire crew is men, except maybe one PA. And that's what I'm used to, especially as you climb the ranks, the higher kind of the responsibility, the executive producer, the network uh, producer, and then up to the people on the board of the network. 
I would recommend, I say this all the time, there's a really great, um, there's a really great documentary called Misrepresentation, M-I-S-S, -S, by uh, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. It's really great. It talks about those issues in the media and how those media issues actually trickle down to changing our perceptions of the roles of men and women, of whether or not men or women are capable of doing certain things. Because when we see them on TV and in the news and in films, we don't realize how much those bombarding images affect our views of how men and women should interact and, and what they're capable of. So I recommend that. I, yes, my, my core there is that I don't, I mean, yes, sexism in the atheist community is a big problem. I don't think it's institutionalized and I don't see it being sanctioned. I definitely see that there are great organizers just like here at Skepticon. I also saw it at Aposticon where they're working really hard to have anti-harassment policies where women are organizing and that's really, really great. Sexism is always going to be there, but I appreciate that in the free thought community, it's the exception, not the rule. I think that, oh, sorry. I think I might be out of time. Yeah, so, so okay. Um, 